I am Andrus Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom, a meeting of our uh, Language of Wisdom study group with Jerry Northrup. This is a one-on-one -on -one meeting where uh, we're trying to meld our minds together. I will be presenting my understanding of three languages, argumentation for how things come to matter, uh, verbalization for how meaning arises, a narration for how events happen. Actually, I'm going to be telling Jerry uh, what interests him, which is the origins of my philosophy he's trying to understand. And in particular, the distinctions I make between God and everything. And so, hi, Jerry. How are you? Welcome. Hi, Andreas. I'm good. So this is the Math for Wisdom website, mathwisdom.com. We're going to enter. And then we're going to go... Um, enter into the language of wisdom sub wiki and we'll be starting here and so uh i'll just give a brief rundown of jerry's uh language of wisdom and my language of wisdom but jerry you had some questions about mine right um i did you, i'm very interested in how all that starts so we'll... how it all started right how it all starts yeah so my understanding of jerry's language of wisdom and we're trying to connect and his is very hand i mean they're both lifelong efforts. His is very hands-on in the biological world. So uh, there's a foundational uh, set of uh, concepts called the relational symmetry paradigm. So it's eight metaphysical concepts uh, that are understood to be foundational. And then there's Ododu, uh, which is a pictorial approximate language that Jerry has constructed to convey additional fundamental concepts. So he's interested in applying that. Uh, and one of the applications would be ecological intelligence, a modular design form uh, that Jerry is developing, which links four levels, an atomic biochemical level, using the language of free energy and maximum entropy. And then uh, on top of that, a microbial cellular level using a genetic algorithm language. And then an animal level using a neural network language. And finally, a human level using our natural constructed and computer languages. And so, uh, this is, for example, in the context of uh, environmental systems, which could be waste management systems. And uh, we're, we're discussing this in the context of an eco-net, which could be meant like as an ecological network uh, of humans and their environments, but also an economical network you know, of humans and environments distributed globally, where we share knowledge uh, and we share failures and successes and somehow uh, on all these levels. So what would that look like? Is that fair presentation of your? Yep, that's fine. And so there's some key readings uh, you can link to from our website. Um, now, my language is also a language of wisdom. I call it Wondrous Wisdom. That's the brand name. Um, and so I'm realizing it is coming from um, four different directions. Um, and so the first, but they've been, it's been kind of like work in parallel. I think um, a very key di direction has been the bottom up. So I, ever since childhood, I've wanted to know everything and apply that knowledge usefully. And I went to God. I was six years old. And I said, you know, I think the most useful thing I could do with my life, you know, would be to know everything. Because then I would know what to do, among other things, you know. And I just had this unbounded ambition. You know, I thought I, and I thought I could do it. You know, I just said, brilliant mind. But I knew it was very dangerous, you know, because it's kind of uh, treading on God's territory. So I thought, well, the right thing to do, you know, just <laughs> the wise thing to do is to go to God. However, you know, but make the effort. And so I phrased it this way. I offered God a covenant. Let's say I offered God a, God a, um, a deal. I said, look, please, you know, uh, because this is so dangerous, you know, because maybe you are, maybe you aren't. You know, I need the freedom to think. Give me the freedom to think whatever I need to think. Maybe you're good. Maybe you're not. Maybe you exist. Maybe you don't. But I'll always believe in you. You know, it doesn't matter what I think. It just matters, you know, how I relate to you, right? But I do want to know, okay? So, and then I'm waiting in my room. That's, you know, with all seriousness, like, well, then what happens now? And, you know, I felt this um, sense that, well, that seemed reasonable or valid or, or you know, so I guess that's what the response is. And so then I thought, well, maybe I need a sign. 
But it very quickly, immediately, I just said, no, don't give me a sign because a sign is always going to be, you know, based on your senses. It's always going to be doubtful. And say, your sign is going to be that you didn't give me a sign. If you want to, you'll always give me a sign, right? That's that, that'll work for me. Like the sign is you didn't give me a sign. So just shows like at the age of six, like how, you know, and then I made a plan for myself of self-study, um, which was, well, I need to be masterful at reading, you know, because the idea was I was going to read everything in the world, you know, writing, you know, and, and math, you know. Um, but I thought, well, I should start with the core things, you know. So I was always looking like, what are the core things to learn? So I thought, well, history. So I should start history from the very beginning and just absolutely everything onward, right? And so I was very disappointed. It turns out like, you know, our library didn't have any books on Mesopotamia, let's say, right? So I uh, started with ancient Egypt. You know, I was very disappointed, like this messing up all my plans. But I found three little books on ancient Egypt. I read them and I was in second grade. And um, I was, uh, the teacher uh, gave us an assignment to write a report. It's like a one page report, you know, on anything we wanted to. So I wrote a 28 page report on the history of ancient Egypt, you know, you know, with scrawling, you know. So that just shows like, I think it just shows like my intent, you know, and so I pursued that. And then when I got to about um, 17 years old, I entered the University of Chicago, uh, which was exciting because, you know, I had gone to a very mediocre high school, you know, I was always independently studying, but now I was going to be among people who are, you know, the highest level uh, of education. And uh, uh, right, you know, before in high school, I thought a lot about physics. I would do little drawings, you know, and doodlings, etc., trying to understand, you know, well, what is mass and what is energy and what is, you know, like from a doodling perspective, right? And got some ideas. I kind of liked it, like things like the binomial theorem, or there's like, I mean, the 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 Pascal's triangle. There's a harmonic triangle. I was thinking about things like that, but it just seemed I became very discouraged uh, when I learned uh, the slightest bit about quantum mechanics. But the idea was that, you know, in reality, like all of physics just fades away in reality, you see. And so there's nothing to grab onto, you see. There's nothing. And it's like you can have, you need billions of dollars worth of equipment and there are no answers, right? Because it just all fades away. It's like nature's saying like, don't look here. That's what it seemed like. So that was discouraging. I got to be smarter than that. So I thought like, where is knowledge to be found uh, you know, God kind of like, help me, give me a clue. But I just thought like, well, I have to look where knowledge is most easily found, but nobody wants to look. So that's wisdom, right? I mean, like wisdom, you know, we're the instrument for wisdom. The human uh, constitution is an instrument of wisdom, but nobody wants to be wise. You know, nobody wants to study wisdom, at least, you know, back in the 80s, let's say, right? So but even today. It's not, uh, it's not, it's considered flaky, you know, to be interested in wisdom. Certain no philosophers would, would be interested in wisdom, which is kind of funny because they're lovers of wisdom, but, um, but they will never admit it. You know? So don't ever believe in it. So then the question was, I went to the University of Chicago and I wanted absolute truth. Well, that was an environment where in the eighties, uh, no one believed in anything. Like you were encouraged to ask the great questions, but you were discouraged from thinking there could ever be any great answers. But I want great answers, you see. So uh, basically what started was uh, I had a very good teacher, Michael Gillespie, for uh, it was a common core class called Political Order and Change. And this is where we ended up reading um, Plato's Republic and uh, Rousseau and uh, ha uh, not Hobbes, but uh, we read uh, Locke and Hume, you know, and then we read Marx and uh, Adam Smith. So it was a great uh, year of reading books uh, uh, as a freshman. But uh, the very first day, he just asked a question. He goes, well, what is happiness? You see. And he, he was a very great teacher because for half an hour, we would always discuss some question. And then he would relate it to the reading, which it, for that day was the Declaration of Independence. You know, so where they talk about, you know, the pursuit of uh, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Right. So what is happiness? So first he does the discussion and then he looks at the reading, you see, and see that all these issues come up in the reading or not. So, and uh, you had to be very sharp to participate in discussion. Like, you know, it went by so fast, people are participating, they're very active, they're from all these fancy schools. So you have to be able to raise your hand to 
get attention before you even know what you're going to say. <laughs> you see, like, it's very difficult. So you had to be able to think on the fly, like very. But what I cooked up uh, at that time, I said, well, what is happiness? You know, notice like that one person says, well, happiness is joy, like in eating an ice cream. See, and so that's like joy. That's like happiness in the action. But for another person, it's contemplation. It's like saying, oh, that was great ice cream. Right. It's in the reflection. It's in the thinking. But for another person, it's in the assurance that, you know, it's the right time to eat the ice cream. You know, it's the right, uh, you know, it's it wasn't stolen, let's say, right? It's the morally good thing to do. It's the appropriate thing to do, right? So this in the being, right? So being, doing, thinking, you can see that this question is triggering this division, right, into modes. And so later on, like I was at a doc film, uh, which is a documentary film, you know, or just basically a film uh, club uh, with my roommate. He was super cultural, Joe Soker, and my other roommate, Sidney Johns III. And we're hanging out for, we went half an hour early to buy tickets. And so I figured out like, well, there's this three cycle. And kind of based on, you know, I think, therefore I am. I am, therefore I do. I do, therefore I think. And the basic idea was that the basic problem, you know, which I was dealing with was like, how do you define absolutes? If people are saying everything's just relative, you see, how do you define absolute? If you know, we know how to define the complicated in terms of the simple, but how do you define the primitives? How do you define the simple things, right? So they have to be defined in terms of each other by way of their relationships to each other. And then because I had given a lot of thought about everything, you know, because also like I had this practical relationship with God. But in terms of knowing, I didn't want to assume God. You see, I wanted to assume as little as possible. That was the whole point of making this deal with God, is I don't have to believe in you. You know, I want to know you. I don't want to believe in you. Right? I, I, maybe I have to believe, but I want to believe as little as possible. What Jesus calls, you know, the poor in spirit, the skeptical, right? Like the scientist, right? Like I just want to believe as, you know, maybe I'll have a hypothesis, but that's all I want to assume. I don't want to, you know, have to assume more than that. So... Uh, or suppose more than that. So uh, it kind of like uh, this structure got me thinking about like it's a division of everything into perspectives, into parts. You see, and very quickly later we read Plato's Republic, and he talks about uh, basically like three castes, but it's basically four levels of knowledge. So he has the in his uh, polis in his Republic. There's the peasant class, which who should be moderate. There's the fighting class of warriors who should be brave. And then there's the ruling class who should be, you know, these philosophers who love beauty and wisdom and things like that. So, but really this distinction between the levels of knowledge, like, so there's the false opinion, true opinion. So craftsmen, they are into these false opinions. You know? <laughs> and then the, what the brave people are, they're, they're able to kind of like have true opinions. But they're still opinions, but at least they have a way of kind of like hanging on to the true opinion and not getting sucked into all these false opinions. But then the rulers are actually able to have wisdom to figure out like, well, what is what, right? But the opposite of wisdom would be this ignorance. So he barely mentions that. But the, basically there's four levels of knowledge and this is different than the threesome. Although it gets colored by the threesome, if you've been watching the videos on the meaning of life, uh, you know, they get connected and they relate to these six sums, which kind of related to this autonome, etc. So that's pretty the story of how it got started. And so I ended up documenting these uh, language of, uh, you know, frameworks, and they seem real. This does not seem like science fiction, like I made that up. Like, so you see a dispute, you say, hey, people are choosing free will, they're choosing fate, but those are the only two choices. That's a division of everything into two perspectives. So by the end of the, you know, the quarter, you know, I went home for Christmas. I had these three basic ABC structures figured out. I had this notion of the division of everything. I was trying to tell my parents. They just thought, wow, like this is something very deeply wrong. He, he's, I was always a good kid. You know, and it's like this is a phase. So my whole life just kind of veered off. You know, I became kind of like uh, just un uncommunicable. <laughs> like, so now I'm kind of reconquering, you know. Any points or questions up to here?
No, you're doing great. You're ask, answering a, a bunch of questions and comments that I was going to get into today. So it, it's really good. Keep going. <laughs> okay. So that's the part A. I wrote here, a bottom-up documentation of cognitive frameworks of the perspectives by which we experience life, especially abstractly, as divorced from direct experience, concerning the limits of consciousness itself, and thereby the possibilities of the conscious and the unconscious. So what I can say now, like, if I had to describe to Dave or um, Krister or Kirby, you know, what's going on now? It's only within the last decade or so that I became aware of this distinction between the, what I would now see is very important between the unconscious and the conscious and the consciousness. So from my um, documentation, you see, like, and maybe I want to emphasize, like, from my point of view, like, I'm not inventing anything. I'm observing, but very difficult things to observe, you know. But I'm observing and I'm documenting and I'm very satisfied that these things somehow hook together, that it's a very tight language. You know, so in a certain sense, it is a language in the sense that like, things are just very tightly related uh, and it's ex expressive and it, it, it just kind of like, uh, and now it's basically finishing. But um, so one of the things that was very helpful, um, and so I realized uh, even the eighth cycle, I realized when I was... Um, third year graduate student, I took a year off um, uh, from my mathematics uh, studies, uh, because I thought like, you know, mathematics is the, you know, I was always studying all kinds of things, but um, uh, I got degrees in math and physics, but I only was only taking one class a quarter in math, one class a quarter in physics, and I was taking one class a quarter in the humanities and in the social sciences. So I got this very general education, but then I needed to focus on math. I thought that's the hardest thing to study on your own. So that's why I got a PhD in math. Maybe that was a good thing to do. Uh, that's why we have Math for Wisdom now. But then um, after uh, my first two years, I went to um, Lithuania, was Soviet-occupied Lithuania for a year break. I got to work on my independent study on my philosophy. They gave me, you know, a tiny stipend and I was able to do that. Um, so uh, that was the year before the Berlin Wall fell. So that had lots of experiences there. But I spent a lot of time like reading uh, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. And so that was very uh, nice to, you know, grapple with that, try to understand with that. And so a lot of the details I started to kind of like sort through. And that's when I figured out that eight cycle. And when I and I figured out the shifts, which is most important, that you can add one perspective, you can add two perspectives, you can add three perspectives, and they'll take you around. And then like with the eight, the eight sum is collapsing into zero, basically, because like if all are good and all are bad, then the system is empty and everything collapses. So the seven sum, so basically, we're starting with a state of contradiction, which would be like God. And from the state of, because the God I'm working with is the God where making as few assumptions as possible. So God is prior to logic. God is prior to math. God is prior to the universe. God is prior to love, prior to humans, prior to intelligence. You know, like, so if you make, so it's basically like a state of contradiction in mathematics where all things are true. And from a state of contradiction, how do you get a state of non-contradiction? And so you basically get things like these divisions of everything. Like, so even the story of Genesis and the Bible, you know, those are days of creation. Well, whose days are they? They are God's days. So what is a day for God? It's an event. So we'll talk about like narration as a language of events. But so an event for God would be a division of everything, let's say, right? So then it all makes sense, the story. You know, he's talking about these, you know, there's these six divisions of everything, and then he rested on the seventh day. So the seventh day is like you can have a self-standing logical system without God, let's say, right? But if you add an eighth day, you go back to zero, the whole thing collapses. It's very fragile. So when I figured that out in uh, that year, like my whole mind, uh, like I had like a mental orgasm, you know, because like, like just bubbles in my brain just going, whoa, whoa, whoa. like it's just really weird. I've had that maybe... Maybe that was certainly once, maybe another time, but basically like I had these weird glands in my brain go off. <laughs> uh, and, you know, what do you do? So that was in 89. You see now, like many years later, I look back at math, I'm looking at bot periodicity. It's an eight cycle also. And the evidence is building that it may very well be the same eight cycle. You see, so it's exciting um, because it's capturing, I think, the symmetries in math. So... But just shifting uh, to say two things. So I knew about this one, two, three shift. Then I realized, well, it's really about adding a perspective. 
or adding a perspective on a perspective or adding a perspective on a perspective on a perspective. And so that's kind of like the first, second, third person. Like I is the first perspective and then you is a perspective on a perspective. And then other, this is how I call the third person, is looking at the side, a perspective on a perspective on a perspective. And then the base is God. So God would be like the zeroth person. So that's one way to think about God is the zeroth person. Um, but now, like uh, my sister for Christmas or something, she, she gave me a book um, by Kahneman uh, called uh, Thinking, Fast and Slow. So what Kahneman and Tversky did, um, and then Kahneman, uh, Tversky passed away, but Kahneman got the Nobel Prize for Economics. He did a, maybe 100 experiments uh, that distinguish between the unconscious and the conscious, where the um, unconscious is um, what they call system one. You see, you couldn't talk about the unconscious and the conscious. So what they did was very clever or very straightforward. He said, we're just going to talk about system one and system two. And system one is very fast and intuitive and system two is rational and slow. But see, what they did then is that they did a variety of tasks, like let's say getting people to place bets. And they were able to show, like, if you study how people place bets, you know, or how they draw conclusions or whatever, that sometimes they have system one operating and sometimes they have system two operating. So when I realized, oh, this is the plus one and plus two, and there should be a plus three. And more and more and more, I got better, better intuition explaining that um, uh, that's these three minds. And I would call them simplest. You know, I, I try to call them. And these are just terms, but I try to use terms that match with ordinary language, common sense language. So I call it uh, the unconscious, the conscious and consciousness. It's a little bit confusing because, you know, consciousness and conscious are two different things. But but that's how we use those words, you know, that there's these two levels. Uh, so I call them that way. Now, uh, so now what I'm able to say, so now, like back in 87, 88 is when I realized I need three languages. But now, just a few days ago, I realized, oh, that's the language. Argumentation is the language of the unconscious. Uh, verbalization is the language of the conscious. And narration is the language of consciousness. You see, so now I'm starting to uh, see. That's why I wasn't making progress on two of those languages, because I needed to know the big picture better. But now I know a lot more about the big picture. And this is one of the things. Um, so that's the first point. And I kind of touched on the second point, which is, okay, so... You get all these facts. This is just empirical science, collecting facts, trying to fit them together, trying to. But then the other way, like, how do you build a theory from this? That's not even really a theory. It's just a bunch of facts. A theory is by giving an interpretation. And so my theory is that there's a God. And how does all these things unfold from God? You know, or what do they all these things unfold from? So that'd be the theory. And that's uh, when you look at that. Um, you, it's very, very hard to think about, you know, and so I'm still working on that uh, belly button of it all. But it's, it is interesting that uh, you get two kinds of uh, directions things are kind of growing in. Like one is, and maybe one is this question, like God is basically, and this is just this, oh, maybe just to say, why is that uh, unconscious, conscious, conscience is so helpful in terms of um, now explaining what I've been doing? My method uh, from high, from these college days and onward, and maybe from before, what I've been doing is I've been abstracting away from experience. I'm saying I'm trying to understand the limits of my mind. So to do that, I have to clean it, like I think Dave Gray calls this, empty the vessel, but basically just clear it from all experience. And so that's basically like unplug the unconscious, first of all. And also try to unplug the conscious. And then you're just left with the consciousness that matches the two. So the unconscious is, you know, a system of hundreds of billions of neurons that are giving an answer. Just unplug that, you know, stop that. And then the conscious is asking questions. So it's got this conceptual language of 100,000 possible concepts. Unplug that. But the consciousness is the one that kind of helps them match. So just focus on the consciousness and you get the picture of this eight-track mind. And that's what bot periodicity is kind of starting to say. What does this eight-track mind look like? And one of the things in bot periodicity that is kind of appearing is that it's like you can make a choice, but every time you make a choice, they're not independent. The reason they're not independent is because your mind is running out of room. You see, you can have a first choice, 
and then a second choice and others. but you can only have basically if you get eight choices your mind fills up and your mind shuts down you're back to zero you see so or your mind just kind of dumps it all so so that's basically like what i'm doing i'm trying to maybe teach someone like um i don't know if it's possible but like to ask someone like chris to like hey like well first of all we cannot understand each other if we rely on the unconscious because the unconscious is personal it's just completely personal like you know that's great but but it's not going to help us communicate so we can communicate through the conscious like not through our answers through our questions this language of questions we can communicate that's why the conscious is so important because you can that's probably like why the conscious got so emphasized is because we want to be able to share with each other knowledge or even share with yourself your knowledge you need to put it in conscious form but furthermore uh, to really understand your, you know, to really kind of like understand what's going on, you need to shut that down. And so that you can just focus on like, what is the consciousness wanting to do? What are the opportunities for the consciousness? So we're going to get shut down soon. Um, then we'll reboot. But do you have any comments right now on this so far? Uh, I, I think this is uh, fascinating. I've been reading an awful lot of what you've written. Mm -hmm. and it's been difficult for me to actually piece together how it evolved. And I'm fascinated with it because I had a, a similar but quite different uh, history and development and came up with very similar structures. And so my real interest is to try and find out how did you come up with yours? Because it seems like it was a very different path from nine. Mm -hmm. And if we can combine these together, what can we learn from that? And, yeah, and it's exciting that when it makes it real and then we can bridge it yeah. and we can learn and it's real. Yeah. And so maybe to say like, that's why um, immediately when I saw your um, relational symmetry paradigm, those eight concepts, immediately I saw, well, this is like you saw with me, like we're speaking a similar language. Right. We're speaking the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, we could quibble about different things, but um, basically like for me, one of those, it's like there's two different fourfold structures. One of them is the foursome. It would be a division of everything. Right. And so when the consciousness experience is like four perspectives are used and four are not where they're invisible to us, the four that are used would be like whether, what, how, why, they're used for the sake of knowledge. So that'd be one variant. But there's another variant uh, that doesn't really come up from um, studying those structures. It comes up from thinking in terms of God. And maybe so that maybe that's why it doesn't quite show up the same way in your uh, thinking. You kind of drew it from the laws of form. Um, but basically, like, when grappling with the notion of God, you get this very uh, important, what I call equation of life. And it says that uh, life is the fact that God is good, but eternal life is understanding that God does not have to be good. So to maybe embellish that a bit, like to say, well, God is beyond conditions. Good is God within conditions. Life is the fact that God is good, means it's the same God, you know, beyond conditions and within conditions. But eternal life is understanding God does not have to be good. Like God is bigger than that. You see, God, good is in system, in conditions. You know, God doesn't have to be good. God is prior to goodness. And the, what that basically, the way we know that is because life is not fair. You see, every time you see life is not fair, you go, yeah, God does not have to be good. You see, and the fact that life is not fair is essential for us to be able to grow. You know, we need to be growing. And see, if you want to grow forever, live forever, learn forever, then you need for God to be not good. You know, or at least you need God to be different than good. You need to have that kind of figured out, hey, like, there's something bigger than our world. Good is just in our world. Good is just conditional. But we in this world, we can relate to things that are bigger than this world. We can have an attitude that's bigger, you see. So it's the difference between, uh, and so like even in physics, you see uh, the ambiguity of entropy. You see like, uh, is the earth a closed system or an open system? You see, are we living in an open system or closed system? So in one sense, we're living in a closed system. You know, like if you include the sun, if you like, you know, everything's going to fall apart. But in the other sense, we live in an open system. This is loved by the sun, right? And it's, it's kind of ambiguous. Well, which is it? It's both. You see, justice is saying that we lived in a closed system. You know, that things have to be fair. This insistence that things have to be fair is like saying, well, and they can't be fair, you see. But mercy is saying that, uh, you know, <laughs> it just, it can, you know, grace, you know, like there can be more than, you know, just get more. It doesn't have to be fair. 
right? So that shows up in physics, uh, that ambiguity. Um, so the point being that like, so both of those appear. And so like, I think in my interpretation, you know, or like I kind of have talked about this with you before, like I suspect that uh, we would want to add a blank page, you know, like you start with a distinction, kind of like Spencer Brown, I think uh, does, you know, you start with a distinction, but let's say before you have a distinction, you have a blank page, right? I think, and say there's a blank page, then you have a distinction, then you have, you know, et cetera. And the last one that you had seemed kind of murky. I don't think much is lost by dumping that one, but maybe I'm wrong. See, so, so I have a lot of intuition on these structures, and that's why in the beginning I thought, well, I really need to understand your intuition. How did you get these structures? You see, but I didn't, I just kind of realized maybe there's not, you know, maybe. So what basically is very similar, uh, eerily similar, like, you know, to wonderfully similar to your relational symmetry paradigm is I have two foursomes um, that are absolutely uh, essential um, as building blocks, you know, in different ways and et cetera. But right. in the most primal way, what happens is that uh, both the foursome, which kind of like is explaining what happens when you have a base, then you have a perspective, a perspective on a perspective, a perspective on a perspective. You get like these four persons, God, I, you, other. You get... Um, four levels, um, which I call like spirit, structure, representations, or maybe a better word, conceptions, and the unity. So an example would be, let's say, God is a spirit, you know, so this equation of life, God is the, you know, eternal life is the fact that God is not good. That's all spiritual. But if you wanted to express it structurally, you see God removes himself, basically like the nature of God is like, or at least based on my imagination, but I think that, you know, this is the same as everyone's imagination. If you spill everything out and you're just left with your consciousness, uh, you try to imagine, well, what happens with this God? Like the only thing possible is to say, well, God could ask the question, is God necessary? Would there be if God if God was not? So that's all God can do. So God removes God. But how, where does God go? There's nowhere to go. So God re, God has to have a self. Like God removes himself by going into his self and thus creates his self. You see, it's a very strange thing, but that's that's the only thing we can imagine. At least I'm claiming that that's, that's all we can do. It's very much like a proof by contradiction, like to say, okay, well, is there God? You know, well, if there is a God, then there is a God. But suppose there's not a God, and yet there still is a God, then there is God, you know, by this proof of contradiction. So you have two tracks. So immediately you get this like division of everything into two tracks. Uh, one track is the spiritual. It's kind of like the spiritual track it says, you know, just assume that there's God and then you end up with God. But the other track assumes that you don't have God, but then still somehow God creeps in, right? Like, so that's the physical world. The physical world assumes that there's no God. There's no God to be found in the physical world, but somehow maybe this spirit of God will creep in. And in the form of, let's say, a godling, you know, so Jesus is the prime example of this godling, right? Like, and so how that relation. So a very important um, uh, presentation of mine is this one about uh, God. And I, I think I include a link there, imagining God's state of mind. And I go through this whole calculus. It's just amazing, like from this point of view, like you can get, and you get the same structures that you do that are just abounding in this, uh, you get a 24 fold right. structure which is uh, just comes up in different ways, but that's a very important way it comes up. So one of that thing that helps uh, to uh, illustrate, though, is that God has this impulse to remove himself, you know. So you end up with structure. So that's the link between God and everything. You see, everything is the structure of God. So when I was in high school, you know, I didn't want to presume God. I wanted to be scientific. Uh, on the other hand, I didn't want to deny God. I just wanted to kind of like go around God in a certain sense. So in the beginning, I was kind of like using everything as a substitute. But, you know, that works a lot of times. Like you have these divisions of everything. Maybe in some cases, everything's actually more relevant. Um, but there's a very subtle distinction between God and everything, which comes up in practical life. Uh, and that subtle distinction um, is that God is spirit and everything is structure. And it comes up in the divisions of everything because... Uh, Everything is the division of everything into one perspective. But God is the division of everything into no perspectives. 
So in bot periodicity, or like if you imagine, like if the brain had a model of the brain, let's say, or the mind, let's say, or the mental workspace, uh, then um, it's just a little map. That map could have a zero perspective, you know, a little node or station. It says, well, it's just empty. <laughs> See, and then that could, that's basically for issues of God, that there's something going on, but it's not us. It's out there somewhere further. Uh, so this is just a brief um, thing. To, and so what happens with these, um, you have this, oh, so in the case of um, structure, that whole equation of life gets rewritten as um, instead of God, you get everything. Instead of good, the structure of good is slack, like, you know, if it's looser or tighter, but slack. Instead of uh, life, you have anything. And instead of eternal life, you have wisdom. And so the equation would be like, you know, anything is everything plus slack. It's kind of strange, but like if you have everything and you have a little slack, you can get anything. <laughs> uh, but wisdom is being able to tease them apart. What's slack and what's the everything? Okay. Then the next level is to say, well, what are the ways that you could conceive this structure? And so there's different ways, like there's four representations of everything, which are the four properties of everything, let's say. Uh, well, actually, this that's not true. That's for the one sum. There's four representations. What you could wish for, they're the four scopes. So you get like everything wishes for, or maybe more accurate, be God through, but you get these wishes for everything, for anything, for something, for nothing. Wishing for nothing means, let's say, God is self-sufficient. God wishes for something means that uh, uh, God is certain. God wishes for anything means God is calm. God wishes for everything means God is loving, cares, like parents care for their children, all the nonsense they wish for. It's like, you know, go beyond. And what this is basically describing, it's like describing, like when you think of God going beyond himself into himself or herself, however she chooses, um, but you have this God who's like this primordial God beyond conditions. And then step by step is like going into the condition. So first there have to arise these conditions, right? Then it has to kind of like, you know, and then it has to kind of like be entering the conditions and it has to be within the conditions. And so the scope is changing as it does that. And that's going through that. And when I give a talk, because I won't give it today, I think I'll give it in a couple of weeks or so on these three languages, but uh, um, give a presentation. But the human life is given by these eightfold structures that are negations of these wishes. Humans do not wish. Humans have reservations. So like God is certain, but we have doubts. We have minds with doubts that we need to address. God has uh, God is self-sufficient, but we have needs. You see, we're not self-sufficient. We have needs and operating principles for meeting those needs. God is calm at peace, uh, but we not. We have expectations, you know, then all kinds of emotions. Right. God wishes for anything, but we don't. We have expectations. And God wishes for everything is loving, but we don't wish for everything. You know, we have values. So like we have our deepest values and stuff. So in a certain sense, like deepest values, it's like an aspect of love, but it's kind of like a substitute for love. Like, you know, love doesn't need any kind of like uh, focal point. Let's say love is just all over the place. You know, we have focal points that we work from. We have values that can replace us. You know, those values are very pretty and, and it's interesting. So, and so how does the, um, these eightfold structures relate us to God on different questions in different ways? And then you take, so then you get six families of structures, you know, so you have eightfold structures with, have ways of responding, blah, blah, blah. Then what you do is you take, let's say God who's self-sufficient and you give him the doubts and counter questions. Normally that would be the God who, you know, so how would God who's self-sufficient deal with that? Well, it turns out that gives you the division, eight divisions of everything. But if you took that God who's self-sufficient and you gave him or her um, the emotional world, then that God would come up with the six conceptions, which are these criteria, representations, ways of conceiving these divisions. But if you gave the God with emotional life, you gave them, you gave that, no, if you gave the God who's, Certain. If you gave the God who's certain, you gave him the emotional life, then they would come up with 12 circumstances. So those are the three basic tables of structures by which we experience either a perspective or a perspective on a perspective. But then the three languages come from this eightfold, I call it the eightfold way. It's like Buddha's eightfold way, 
But basically, there's three variants, permutations, which are like, you know, the Lord's Prayer or the Beatitudes or what I call St. Peter's Keys to Heaven. But, but if you take those eightfold frameworks and you look at either God who's, um, if you look at God who's certain, no, I'm sorry, if you look at God who's self-sufficient, then you'll get the language and narration. That's how consciousness sees things. But and it'll be like threefold units. But if you look at God who's certain experiencing this, uh, you know, like values and questions and whatever that we have for our the human will, the God who's certain looks at that and sees a language of um, verbalization, which would be how meaning arises, which would be like the language of the conscious, how we're able to ask questions. And then if you take the God who is calm, and you give him like this human will and God will relationships to worry about, then that God will see a language of argumentation, how things come to matter. So those are the three languages. And so now I can see more, understand, explain better. But like back in 87, I saw, oh, I saw the Eightfold Way. I saw three permutations. I saw I have these static structures, but there's got to be a way to have a dynamic language. I thought this must be a framework for a dynamic language, and there should be three of them. And so then I went to Lithuania with the idea that I will, I think the language of narration would be the easiest for me to work on. And I will uh, figure out, uh, and so I chose some data. I said, I'm going to study 60 Lithuanian folk tales. And I came up with a beautiful theory of narration. So I'll be able to present that, maybe not today. Um, but um, so all this, does, oh, so maybe the point is, so that's the second level. The third level, oh, that's the third level of conceptions. You get these wishes. Uh, so there's four conceptions of everything in terms of, um, Let's. did I get this right? No, the four conceptions of everything are, um, hmm, <laughs> I'm getting confused. Good has two conceptions, increasing slack, decreasing slack. Okay, four I think everything has four conceptions. Yeah, everything has four conceptions. Um, there would be these, uh, not the wishes. That's something that, that's more like the how, how God is conceived. Everything has four conceptions would be uh, like related to everything, anything, something, nothing. Uh, so if you take those six together, anything has six conceptions, which are the choices that we can make in life. But goodwill kind of like goes beyond that. Those are the directions of goodwill. Like so for every, like there's eight directions of goodwill. So wisdom, when you try to conceive it, it practically becomes about showing goodwill. What are the ways of showing goodwill? And then when you look at the unity of that, uh, the unity of, um, I guess the unity of those four wishes is love. Love is the one that kind of like is the most expansive. So maybe, maybe it is those four wishes. Uh, the unity of, Increasing slack, decreasing slack for good, uh, which is like identity, uh, is um, perfection. So love is the unity of the conceptions of the structure of God. So when they say God is love, then the technical way to say that would be love is the unity of the con you know conceptions of the ways of thinking about the structure of God. Uh, whereas perfection is the unity of the conceptions of the structure of good. The human will is how we unite the choosings, the ways of choosing, which are the structures of anything, which is this, you know, which is, I mean, which are the conceptions of anything, which is the structure of life. So will and life are related, but God's will is related to eternal life. And so then the equation in the end becomes that, you know, the human will is to love the perfect, but God's will loves the imperfect. You see, it's very beautiful. And see, that idea, that whole statement there is very lovely. Uh, you know, we love the perfect. And we're just, but God's loves the imperfect, God's will. That's why we have to follow God's will, so that we could love the imperfect. And this is simply a mechanical result of applying this system. I just love it. You know, I mean, because it says, well, that's a very useful, profound thing to, for me, at least, I think. And so that's a four by four. So when you draw a four by four, and I have this four by four, you see, it's the same four by four. And then, in a certain sense, there's a deeper four by four, which is basically taking God's four investigations and humans' four investigations, and you get this four by four. I think that the eight cycle is a four plus four. So you have the same four and four, but you add them, and you get an eight-track mind, you see, and you're kind of going through them. So, but see, this is all very uh, difficult and murky, and I'm working on it, but I'm, 
And so then what I decided, uh, I was working on it and I decided, well, I want to be able to talk about this research. Then I thought, well, I need to give some, I, I started to do videos. I go, well, I need to talk about some preliminaries. <laughs> and I realized there's a lot of preliminaries I got to talk about. So there'll be like 20 videos. So the whole thing is, get, but see, then this is a way to just to speak out my philosophy in a series of, you know, every week now I'm doing a video. So like the meaning of life was supposed to be, you know, one video, but then it's going to be six videos just because why not? You know, it's, I can't make it more than, so this is a nice uh, part of that series. The whole point of this being that the bottom up documentation is a very empirical science. It's just a very unusual science, but it's documenting limits of our mind in different clever ways, you know, which could be like just studying people's arguments you know, that they have these stupid arguments and they're breaking up things and everything into perspectives. But the thing that I've been just telling you about this part too, it's a top-down interpretation. So it doesn't say things have to be that way, but it's saying theoretically, what's a useful way to talk about it? So I'm talking about it through some primordial God, right? But you, your theoretical model could be to say, you start with consciousness. So that could be an equally valid model. Now, probably like you're going to pick up on certain things like, then I'm going to pick up on different things. So if you make certain assumptions, you know, in your theoretical model, you're going to get a different, it's going to have pluses and minuses, but I kind of realized you may have pluses for figuring out these languages of argumentation, verbalization that I have not achieved, you know, in 35 years since then. Uh, although now I feel in a better situation, but I would lean on your, this, this is where like, it would be helpful for me to lean on your instincts because see, it's a different, like you said, you're in the midst of it. See, I was able to get the language of narration because that's the language of pure consciousness, I think. I'm not in the muck. God's not in the muck. That God who's certain, I mean, who is self-sufficient. But see, once you get into a God who wishes who wishes for nothing, but see, once you get into God wishes for something, gives wishes for anything, that God is entering this very soup, like you say, this murky world where like everything's conscious out there, you know, like, if the universe already exists in a certain way, like, and it's all, you're jumping into the middle of things, right? I've never thought about that. So why would I know about that, right? But you may know, so you may know about that. So it's interesting. That's a very concrete place too. Any thoughts or comments? Or? Oh, yeah. So lots of it. This this is going to be fascinating going forward. Uh, I think the initial takeaway that I've got here now is to focus on the specific origin and difference between God and everything. Mm -hmm. as to exactly what you mean by that and how you came to that. And that's going to tie back to my looking at a point as being a, the most primitive diagram type of thing in the line. And then you've got the notion of distinction. So a point and then distinction as opposed to God and everything. How do we talk about those and and how do we introduce ourselves into those as concepts so that if we wake up and we got all this soup that i call mm -hmm. um and is that everything is that god what is the difference if there is a difference and i think then i get a better handle as to how you go with your divisions of everything from there uh, but I think so I made some videos to... uh, uh, which if you watch the wondrous wisdom uh, playlist, uh, you will see I've made like three or four videos about the God, uh, how I think about God in different ways. That's probably a good thing to, if you could watch. It's, it's yeah. sometime, but have you seen those or not or, or noticed those? I've seen a lot of them. Uh, so I, I, you know, don't have it all completely systematized mm -hmm. yet in terms of, of understanding, but um I was initially kind of put off by the use of God and the, that concept because that really hasn't been uh, a, a concept that I have, have mm -hmm. been comfortable with or used. I'm, I'm more comfortable with the notion of a universal consciousness mm -hmm. type of thing. But to go back and, and look at that now is is God versus everything versus the concept of nullsome and onesome, mm -hmm. so how that goes. And I can see once you've got that kind of thing resolved in terms of why isn't God everything or why isn't everything God, then you can start to talk about how you do divisions and then your notion of doing a divisions into two-some existence, non-existence, and you know, three-some, four-some, and, and on, that starts to make uh, a lot more sense. And I, I see the mapping of the symbolic structures 
that is is very consistent. And now it's the, to me, it's the interpretation of the start. Yeah, and and I think we have very different this... backgrounds on that. I think that's that's going to be a really interesting. Uh, so there's this. So I can go back and see what your specifics are. And so um, there's a lot I do say that you know you can read, but I think I'm trying to focus on what I don't say that might be helpful. And I think it's just the personal tension, you know. So here I am, like wanting to have it both ways, you know, as a child, as a teenager, as an adult. Uh, right. Uh, and the both ways is that. Um, You know, I, I, I'm kind of like God friendly, you know, like <laughs> I prefer there to be a God than not a God. Like, you know, why not? Right. Like, you know, so I'm God friendly. But in a certain sense, it's like at arm's length. It's like I want to be in charge. Right. Like, I don't want, <laughs> you know, like, uh, like, I don't want, you know, like, what can we get without you? You know, what can we do without you? Like, so first of all, like, I prefer not to assume you. Right. right. Uh, so like, could you just kind of step aside? So the God I end up with is a God who just naturally kind of steps aside. That's just the way God works. You see, but in my life anyways, so I don't know if that's me or if that's just, right. but maybe that's the way the imagination is structured for the consciousness, you know, that like you have this interesting relation with God, like when, when you're independent, then you kind of sort of wish like, well, I'd rather God do and be and think. That's what the eightfold structure is. It's basically it's like our father, the Lord's prayer it says, look, I'm going to pray to the God. Who's my God? I'm going to pray to the God who loves me more than I love myself, you know, wants me to be alive and sensitive, responsive more than I could ever want to. That's a parent, parent, you know, in their child relationship, right? Like the parent yeah. just is better off, you know, understanding what's going on in the child. And if I have, if I'm in touch with such a God, I'd rather God think than I think. Right. And I'd rather God be than I be. And I'd rather God do than I do. So like these things like hallowed be thy name, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And it's especially like better you, you know, than me. Right? But a lot of times I'm not in touch with God. So like even Jesus on the cross is like, why did you abandon me? See, like a lot of times we're not in touch. So then I need to rely on my three cycle, like science, you know, like I take a stand, I follow through, reflect, I take a stand. So like give us this day our daily bread so that, you know, when I take a stand, I can follow through. I'll do that, but you gotta feed me, right? <laughs> or, yeah. you know, like, like uh, I'll look at what I do, right? But you gotta forgive me my sins, you know, like, like just help me out a bit, like, you know, cause I wanna look at what I do, right? But you know, forgive me my sins the way that I forgive those. Others. Or like, yeah. you know, I wanna take a stand, you know, I think a whole bunch, I wanna take a stand. I'm vulnerable, like, don't lead me into temptation. You know, I'm trying to make a good choice, right? So these are all supporting this three cycle. And then it's just like, um, and deliver us from evil. It's basically saying like, you don't have to be this loving parent God. You know, you don't have to be this perfect God. Just be the good enough God. Like, just save us. <laughs> you know, like, 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 I'm trying to do this three cycle. I'm trying to learn. I'm not in touch with you, but just kind of watch over me, please. You know, like from this horrible things that could go wrong, right? Like, you know, climate change or whatever. So see, so what this, that's this eight cycle. That's the framework for all three languages. But in this version, thinking comes first, then being, then doing. And you can see there's three permutations. That's why we have three languages. And you get three different structures. So you get the Beatitudes, you get St. Peter's, what I call keys, keys to heaven from faith to love which basically seems the same as Buddha's Eightfold Way. It's kind of curious. Um, but um, when you pray this, when I pray this prayer, I feel this flickering. You see, like if I'm in touch with God, God is basically saying, you go do, be free. You do what you want to do, right? Like, but when I'm doing my stuff like that, I feel like, oh no, I think so. God help me, help me, help me. You know, so there's this kind of flickering, like, am I in touch? Am I not in touch? And the other thing is that, this is an eightfold structure. The mind can handle six perspectives at most, you know, like that's just like the, the limit, you know, introspecting. So once you get to seven slash eight, you see, it's just over the top. So that's why when you pray these things, you pray them, it's like it just flattens a person out. That's why the prayer is very effective uh, from that point of view. So, so like when I pray that prayer and I make each line resonate or just I, I deduce the structure, it's like, it's like, like, God is somewhere like the universe rips open and like God is somewhere out here. I can't see. It's like I'm sitting in a well, you know, standing in a well and there's like star above that's saying I can't see the star, but I can feel that I suspect there's a star. Maybe I could try to see its reflection in the bottom of the pool of the well, that kind of situation. See, so that's very um, 
Now it's really through the window of the unconscious, but basically what I'm doing, it's like setting up this antenna to try to reach a God beyond me, right? How can I engage a God who's beyond me? How can I talk to God and hear to God? And so then you ask a question, let's say, or, you know, you, you or just listen, but like you ask a question, you get an emotional response, typically emotional, you know, and so, but the idea is that it's constant, you see, and then you can translate that emotional mood or response into words. It's like translating, you know, an answer or something. And so, so then once you practice this a lot, then you know, like, am I in touch with God? Am I not in touch with God? How do I get in touch with God quickly? You know, and so when you're engaging a gang, you know, you see, it's very helpful, like to be able to be able to be in touch with God. And this is all, this could all be delusional, but the point being, it's very useful. You know, like how do you let go of yourself? You know, so that you're not thinking about yourself when a gang is cursing at you. You're able to think like, just forgetting about yourself. But I want to focus on the gang, focus on God. So it's very practical. So this is, uh, and this is just one family of structures. There's four, like for each of the wishes, there's another structure. But this one relates the human will and God's will and values. So I have to make a video about each of these families. Um, that's after I do the meaning of life. That's what I'll be working on. <laughs> well, what? What I would like to do is again come back to the most foundational stuff here. And we'll start with everything. We start with you. We start mm -hmm. with God. Uh, do we how how do these all interrelate as to who I am? Do you can do you construct everything? Do you construct God? Is it the other way around? Uh what do we what do we set up for the most preliminaries? Because I think we both agree as to how you go from there into four and then in, into eight you've got cyclical threesome and, and the rest of it that all looks uh reasonably consistent and i think the, the key level in terms of being able to communicate it and understand it to other people is to get very clear definitions of what we understand what is everything do we start with everything do we start with ourselves do we start with god uh what is the difference and how do they relate well, and so when, I think basically what I'm doing here with these four bullet points, I've gone through the top two, but I'm basically saying like, you kind of have to work on all four at once. Uh, but so like okay. everything, like the bottom up documentation, there's no God in there, really. It's like, or well, that's a little bit like God comes in later, kind of like you, you know, but basically you start with everything. You see, and you do divisions of everything. Like, so the two, some three, some four, some don't really relate to God. But the other one, God does not have to be good, life is not fair. That's all about God, you see. And so those are two different foursomes, which that distinction is very clear in mind. Like they both are in play, like whereas you have the same pair of foursomes, but like that distinction is not so clear in your case. Uh, it's not clear at all, I think, or maybe, you know, at least I haven't. But I, but I really, they seem to be this similar. So um, we could also look at Spencer Brown. I don't know if that's uh, the laws of form, um, if you've been drawing from that. But um, I, yeah, I'm not so sure. Um, that broke down for me a little bit when he really tried to uh, to get back into Boolean algebra from it. I felt that was a flawed logic, and I think maybe he fixed that up a little bit in later versions. Mm -hmm. I but uh, no, I I think we've got. We've got a, a framework that we basically agree on. Mm -hmm. and I think the, the key point now is to see if we can um, construct the foundational language so that it, it means the same thing for both of us. And this comes back to this concept of covariance. What I say, I have an obligation to make sure that you understand it right. in the way I mean to say it and back and forth. And that's a dialogue type of responsibility that we both have. And I think this is a great way to to go with it. So um, this discussion today has been very helpful in terms mm -hmm. of seeing some of the uh, gaps in what I, I was understanding before and where to go to, to get the rest of it. But I think it's going to come back down to this thing as to where we start. Uh, what Where do you start when you first wake up? Oh, 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 uh, that'll be your... No. Let me just give a couple more, maybe more, much more briefly. But uh, sure. and so this is coming from me preparing for this meeting with you and just preparing for this page for your colleagues, uh, uh, you know, to see, can I understand you? And then, well, can I understand myself? But so the bottom up, the top down, that there's this distinction where like God's not very uh, primary in this bottom up documentation. 
although some holes appear where you realize, you know, I think this hole is there for God, let's say, potentially, let's say. Whereas the top down, like you just start with God and try to imagine uh, what uh, God would yeah. be all about. Um, and in my case, assuming as little as possible about God. Yeah. Uh, so then um, the third one is really related to Math for Wisdom in the sense that like, this is inner life. So here I'm talking about the unconscious, conscious, consciousness uh, from my experience of it, especially with regard focusing on the consciousness, you know, throwing away the unconscious and conscious as much as possible. But see, can I talk about that? Can I hook that into science? So in two ways, one is in terms of advanced mathematics, right? Like, so this bot periodicity seems really central and very uh, fruitful. And then it's very interesting that bot periodicity, what you end up, I've been talking to Thomas Gaidasek and I'll be talking to John Harlan, but uh, it's based on um, these um, basically like divisions of everything. But what they're acting on is this universe. It's like a model of the universe, which is called uh, O infinity. But basically like O2 would be rotations of a circle and, and also reflections, right? Like uh, they're, they're isometries, but so isometries would be either like you can rotate a circle. How do you map a circle onto itself and preserving distance? You can rotate it, but you could also reflect it where like positive becomes negative and vice versa. You kind of flip it across. Yeah. And with a sphere, you can rotate it or you could flip it across. And three dimensions, four dimensions, you know, all the way up to infinity, You they nest. So two dimensional rotations fit within three dimensional rotations fit within four dimensional. You can stack them all up infinitely. That's called O infinity. If you include the reflections, which are included in O infinity, then you get like two branches of this world. One in which it's just pure rotations. The other one where there's a reflection and a rotation. If you reflect twice, you get back in the original world, you know, branch of the world. So you have these like two branches. And it really, I just kind of dawned on me, you know, like after years, you know, of trying to, Think about Bob Pierce sort of like, oh, that's modeling the unconscious and the conscious. You see, because the unconscious is taking the world and presenting it as uh, connections between 100 billion neurons. And the conscious is taking the world, uh, the same information and presenting it as a language of 100,000 concepts. And the consciousness is kind of like relating those two, making sure that they, you know, are communicating. And so that's what O infinity is set up to do, number one. That's exciting, you know, uh, because now all of a sudden it starts to become, see, and then you you start to get, I've been attending these uh, conferences on the mathematics of consciousness science, but you see the model I'm presenting looks very well with the data and it makes lots of uh, suggestions, even predictions, you know, like what you should, where things should go. So, but this is a very, makes it very concrete, like that this bot periodicity could actually be modeling consciousness in a very concrete way with regards to a very concrete model of the universe. But it doesn't stop there. Um, in physics, you see, uh, the symmetries of physics pop up in all this spot periodicity, what's called CPT, a charge conjugation, parity, and uh, and uh, time reversal. Well, it turns out that those seem very much related to the twosome, threesome, foursome. These are very metaphysical things, and so maybe I'll discuss that uh, in a different video with uh, John. But the thing I want to mention is that, you see, the weak force, which breaks one of these symmetries. You have to have all three in order for it to be uh, respected, let's say, CPT. The weak force uh, breaks it by saying, you know, uh, the universe is left-handed from the weak force's point of view. And so like the left-handed particles uh, will function, but right-handed particles don't see it. They don't function. So there's a, you see, when you look at the laws of the universe, you ask yourself questions like, well, would the laws change if I move the universe over by, you know, 10 meters, right? Or if I flipped around, like it's not supposed to change under certain basic symmetries, right? Right. But so here's this, like if you put the universe in a mirror and you change left-handed to right-handed and vice versa, like, well, you would get a different universe, basically. You see, you it would not be symmetrical. You see, uh, with regard to the weak force, with regard to gravity it would not be a problem, I think. With regard to weak force, you would be a problem. So now it's like by Occam's razor, Mathematically, we have room for two universes. Only one of them exists, ours. Except, well, why not have the other one? You see? And it just seems like there's room for the other one. Why doesn't it exist? Right? Why shouldn't it exist? It probably presumably does exist. Because otherwise you need a rule explaining why it doesn't exist. Potentially, right? 
if you had two universes, now one would be based on this reflection, you see. And all of a sudden, it's like these notions of duality that people get very upset about that it doesn't exist. Like, no, it's in the math, you see. <laughs> like, so you could then have, like with Christopher Alexander, like you could have a materialist structural universe, but you could have a universe of flows of activity. You see that structure, you know, recurring activity evokes structure, structure channels activity. So you could basically have a, a uh, unconscious universe, the material universe possibly. Then you could have a conscious universe, you see. And then you could have consciousness kind of coupling them slice, you know, in different ways, like making sure that they link. Well, that would be, see, and then uh, maybe I'll just show. Um, so you see, that's the but, third part is that this is new, but it's just kind of like exciting to say one way to look at the language is just to try to explain it in advanced mathematics, you know, formalize these structures from that. It's, it's not necessarily that they'll exactly match simply because certain things may be missing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it's saying, but at least it makes it concrete in certain ways. Yeah. There still is the whole thing of, of tying it to actual experience and evidence. Right. But at least it's put in a mathematical concrete form where like you right. can, you, and maybe it's wrong, but maybe it's right. Maybe the predictions are helpful. So these yeah. whole ecological ideas, you see all of a sudden it's like, they, the idea is that that second universe could be intertwined in this universe. We may be living in a double universe. So this idea of like a physical, spiritual double reality, it's maybe completely natural according to that model right. of the universe. And would explain, then we would have to understand how they couple, you know, how they, right. but we see like in the left brain, right brain, uh, user requirement situation that there's an evolution of user requirements that's not exactly matched by the implementations, you see. And so they only look at implementations. They're not looking at user requirements, those scientists. And maybe just to conclude, we'll be kicked off here maybe, uh, or I don't know, but uh, the fourth yeah, thing is the whole point of math for wisdom is to apply these results as a language of wisdom to foster an investigatory community, culture, civilization of independent thinkers living in consciousness, deliberately, willfully, devotedly, collaboratively with God and with each other. So I guess it's about the conscience as to say what we're doing with math for wisdom is we're creating this beginnings of this community. It's it's not a community of answers or questions. It's a community of investigations. You see, it's a consciousness community. So um, uh, can we do that? Can it hook into other such communities and be like, you know, living, uh, participating in? And what would God's role be in that? You know, like, can God be an investigator? You know, can we hook into God's investigations? So See, to what extent can God be real? And I think that um, this could help make that real. Um, it's you know, I mean, basically, like, if we live in this double universe, there's no reason, there may be, it may be completely possible to go into the afterlife to come back, you know, to kind of like do all kinds, like, you know, right. there, it may be all engineering ways possible, you know, to explain how prayer works, you know, it'd be very fascinating um, to live in that kind of double universe. Yeah, you know, we have we still have to tie it down to what actually works, what we can really experience, and and I think there's, a, well, from my perspective, that's that's a fascinating part of it because I think it does does relate. There should be ways we can test all this, and so and so to connect it, um, I had a uh, oh here it is the language of wisdom. So I just want to show, and you 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 know you have the link, um, but I just want to show. Uh, Oh, well, I have the link to the language of wisdom, the three languages. Oh, the three languages is down here. Here it is. Yeah. I want to show just at the where they put in the, um, I've been working on this today. Here's this, uh, my version of your uh, autonome. You see, and so you have this six sum. And if you add God and good, right, then you get that eightfold structure I talked about with the Lord's Prayer or the Buddha's Eightfold Way, etc. You see, so it is very uh, relevant, like to these, and these probably are the three languages. So like you have these three languages. Um, so like I'm saying, I think that the th there's no reason, like you sometimes mentioned having four modules. I think there's three modules. So you're doing yours based on the physics, let's say that you have the physics of, you know, the different physical levels. But I'm saying in the way I'm doing it, it's just completely metaphysical saying that it doesn't matter what level you're on, uh, they all can be participating in these three types of things, um, sure. potentially. Yeah, they all, all can have a, basically the same language structure. Right. Which is the way I'm looking at it, I think. Thank you for watching this video. 
please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And you know, I'm just I'm grateful, and you know, I I want to support that, and you know, our weekly or bi you know semi weekly or bi weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So, yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.